Let me introduce our first speaker tonight. Um, this is Paul Wilson. He's from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which I love because, of course, I got my PhD from there, too. So a little prejudice, but it might be just the best place to work anywhere. Besides Wheaton. Wheaton's a great place, too. But, you know, I should say that, too. Anyway, um, so from the, from the University of Wisconsin, uh, Paul did, let's see, his bachelor's degree at the University of Toronto, if I recall correctly, and then spent some time in Germany uh, doing uh, upper-level degree work there in Karlsruhe, and then uh, back to Madison for his, for his PhD there in nuclear engineering, and then uh, has been doing research in a variety of areas, actually, computational side of things, uh, nuclear side of things, also dabbles a little bit into, more than dabbles probably, into the sociology and political aspects kind of... Um, of nuclear energy and uh, brushes up against those topics. So I think it's wonderful to have him here as a speaker. Tonight uh, we are focusing in on advanced nuclear reactors with particular attention to how we might uh, do something different with the fuel cycle in nuclear reactors to be able to take care of some of the problems like waste problems and things like that. So I think you're in for some interesting ideas, innovations in nuclear energy. And so he's going to kind of lay the groundwork uh, for the whole evening of talks, I think, by introducing the topic. So we'll give him a warm welcome. So thank you for that, that introduction. Um, I'm particularly glad to see you all here tonight because I know as much as all of you that the competing engagement for this evening is to watch the Badgers in the Sweet 16. It started about 15 minutes ago. But, so I'm glad that you all chose to come and listen to me instead of watch my other Badgers uh, up in Anaheim today. So uh, we spoke a little bit a few months ago, and we, we laid out a program here. Um, and I know Dr. Maldonado, and, I, and I've met Dave. And, and so we're going to be able to give you a hopefully non-overlapping set of talks. And, and as you just heard, my goal here is to kind of lay the groundwork in understanding what advanced nuclear fuel cycles are, what some of the issues are that will drive us, maybe one day, maybe not, to pursue advanced nuclear fuel cycles. And then these guys are going to follow up with some of the technology we may use to do that. Um, so. Uh, other button. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about basically are sort of these three main points at the highest level. I'm going to give you an overview of what we call the once through fuel cycle. This is what we do today. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the history and the policy of nuclear waste. Um, this is one of the major drivers, not the only driver, but one of the major drivers people look at when they consider advanced nuclear fuel cycles. And finally, more broadly look at what are the sustainability challenges that face nuclear energy. And this would be a more broad set of things that I think are going to be driving the question of whether or not we pursue advanced nuclear fuel cycles in the future. So here's the standard canonical picture of what we do today. Right? We, we mine uranium out of the ground. We enrich it in facilities um, around the country, around the world. We put it into fuel fabrication, a big facility down in South Carolina, for example, and then we put it into our reactors. It stays there for something like four to six years, and then we take it out and store it for a while, and we hope one day, based on the current policy, to put it in a geologic repository. And that's it, nothing else. Right? And so, so it's a pretty simple scheme in that sense. Um, and so we're going to start by talking a little bit about what, what that looks like today. So uranium mining, milling, and conversion, conversion lumps everything together at the beginning. This is the beginning of our nuclear fuel cycle. Um, it's a pretty modest domestic resource. We haven't mined a lot of uranium in the United States for commercial purposes in a long time. Um, there is uranium. As the prices go up, interest goes up. Prices go down, interest goes away. Um, sort of a rocky history in terms of some of the socio-political impacts of uranium mining, particularly in the Four Corners part of the country. Um, but right now, we rely primarily on foreign sources. Fortunately, pretty stable foreign sources. Australia and Canada. I grew up in Canada, so, so I can vouch for its stability um, as a source of uranium. Uh, Canada has one of the richest deposits up in the north. Australia is very rich in uranium. Um, moving into some more interesting parts of the world, Kazakhstan has a very large uranium resource and, and is really moving to try and be a big supplier of uranium in the world right now as well. Um, we mine it in a form that we call yellow cake. It looks a lot like this once you've converted it and removed it from the ore. Um, it's yellow, which is why we call it yellow cake. Uranium was used historically before nuclear energy came along primarily as, a, as an agent to put into glasses to give it a green, so sort of this glowing green colored glass. It's also used in fiesta ware. Um, we, nuclear engineers like to go around collecting old fiesta ware because you can hold a Geiger counter against it and it'll go off. Um, 
Um, so we chemically extract it from this ore and we convert it into uranium hexafluoride, it's a gas. And that's the, the gas that we use for the rest of the front end to do the enrichment process and also to do the uh, fuel fabrication process. Right, so the next step is where we start to get interesting and that's enrichment. So when you mine uranium, oh, we'll, we'll delve into a little science here even. When you mine uranium, there's two isotopes that occur naturally um, and they occur in roughly these proportions. Less than 1% is what we call uranium-235. This is the good stuff, all right? Um, and 99.3% is uranium-238, the not so good stuff, until you hear Dave's talk. But, um, right now, it's not so good for us, right? We can't use it in the reactors we have today. Turns out that this isn't, for most of our reactors in the United States and around the world, this is not good enough. We need to enrich it. We need to take this amount and increase it. We use this uranium uh, hexafluoride, and as you can maybe appreciate, the difference between these is very small. Right? It's three parts in 300 and something, in, in 250 something. So it's a very difficult process. Um, this is a picture of centrifuges. Right? These are the ones that are the most common technology today to perform enrichment. Um, there, France has centrifuges. Um, the Germany and the Netherlands and the UK have a <coughs> joint operation with centrifuges. Their centrifuges are now operating in New Mexico um, in a, by a company oddly named Louisiana Enrichment Services. Um, <laughs> and, and so we have centrifuges primarily, that's the main way we enrich uranium around the world. And it takes us from this less than 1% uranium-235 up to, let's say, 4% uranium-235. And this is what we put in our current reactors in the United States. And this is about the kind of enrichment up to 5%, maybe a little higher. And here's where Ivan will tell you more about those sort of options to, to get the energy out of our reactors. This is a very energy intensive process. In the grand scheme of things, we produce far more energy out of our nuclear energy system than we put into this. But if you look at the whole fuel cycle from beginning to end, this is the place that takes the most energy to, to, to put into the system. So then we fabricate it into fuel rods, all right? And it's uh, useful to draw a picture well, here I've drawn you a picture, but let's sort of give it some scale, right? So each one of these fuel pellets is about the size of the last digit on your pinky. And we stack those up inside usually a zirconium rod, all right, zirconium metal cladding. We stack it up about 12 feet tall. And then we put a couple of hundred of these together in a grid like this. There's these little spacers that hold them all together. There's top secret things in there that companies make their money off of to make the water all flow well and, and remove the heat. And we put a few hundred of these into a reactor at one time. And each of them stays, as I said, for about four and a half to six years. Usually we swap out about a third of the time every year and a half. Okay, and most reactors in the United States do that either in the spring or the fall because that's when our energy demand is the lowest. And that's the best time to shut a reactor down. Um, so what happens then? It goes in the reactor, it's consumed, it stays there for four to six years. The uranium gets consumed and we produce other things. And I like to draw this picture this way um, to sort of give you the two wings, okay? Because what happens is we put the uranium in and what comes out are a bunch of things lighter than uranium, all right? About three and a half percent of the weight that comes out is stuff that's lighter than uranium. Um, a few percent of it comes out heavier than uranium, most notably plutonium, but other things that are heavier than plutonium. And everything else that comes out is the uranium we put in there in the first place, right? So this is the first sort of thing that you might notice is that really when we take fuel out of the reactor, this nuclear waste problem that some people point to, the spent nuclear fuel question that we have, we largely have mostly uranium that we're taking out of the reactor. It's the same uranium we mined out of the ground. It hasn't really changed except we've made it into these little pellets. Right? And we've now mixed it with a bunch of lighter than uranium stuff and heavier than uranium stuff. Okay, so one of the things to take away from this is that picture of how much of the spent nuclear fuel is actually this radioactive material about which we're pretty concerned, which is we should be concerned about too much radiation, but not, but not concerned about just a little bit of radiation. So now we store it. And today what we do is we take it out of reactors and we store it first in pools at our reactor sites. These are very big swimming pools with very pure water. Um, and these people get paid every 18 months to move the fuel around and put it into different slots in there. Um, it's a very safe way. I mean, it's, it's a static system. The water just sits there. We store our fuel there. It has to stay there for between five and 10 years because it's actually physically pretty hot when it comes out of the reactor. And so it is still producing heat. And so we have to keep it in there to keep it cool. Once it's cooled down enough, we can move it to these above ground storage facilities. Here's an example of one. Um, these are, you can see a sense of scale. There's a person up here. The person who gave me this picture, it was one of her students who I think maybe one of those people up there on the, on the top. But 
Um, but these are these canisters, and, and we'll talk a little more about them in a minute, but they're steel line canisters with, with something like 10 to 20 fuel assemblies inside each one. They're cool enough that just the natural air cooling around here, very often there's a little hole here, there's sort of this little path that winds around this this concrete and the air can sort of swing through there and it can remove the remaining heat that's still being produced, but, but it's not going to overheat. And these just sit out there on a pad right now until we figure out what's next. Right? And so around the country, we have reactors building these facilities, many of which didn't intend to do so when they first started operation. And then what's supposed to happen next is we put it underground forever. <coughs> right? And all countries that have a plan have planned for deep geologic repositories. Right. Various studies have looked at the options. In, in any crowd like this, someone always thinks, well, why don't we just shoot it into space or to the sun? And they've looked at that and they decide that's not a good choice for a lot of reasons. If you were alive in 1986 when Challenger blew up, right, that may be one of the reasons. If we miss the sun and it comes flying back to Earth, that may be another reason. And we have various trees that say you just don't throw your junk into space. Okay? So, um, so space isn't an option. You can look at other solutions on land. But every country that has a plan is pursuing geologic disposal. Some countries are further ahead than the United States. Um, there's, there's many variables that come into play here now. Which type of rock will you put it in? Um, what are the properties of that rock? How do you design a repository that are suited for the particular properties of the, of the geologic medium? Um, what kind of containers will you use? Will you design it to be able to be retrieved? Or will you assume that you never go back and retrieve it? Uh, and what's the water table like? Are you just putting it below the water table, which in fact is an option in some places, or above the water table? Um, major hurdles, there's three. Um, site selection, site selection, and site selection. In the case anyone wonders what the fourth one is, it's still site selection. Right? Choosing a place to put this is a very challenging problem. The political structure of this country makes it a more challenging problem here than nearly anywhere else in the world because of the way that we have so many layers of government that all get to have effective veto power over others in making these things happen. So the other thing, if you learn anything here that I want you to take away are my three C's of spent nuclear fuel. All right? And so the first one is compact. All right? And so one of the things for people, like, I want to make sure people appreciate about using nuclear fuel is if we did a little thought experiment and imagine that each of you live for 80 years, hopefully some of you many more, hopefully all of us many more, but if you live for 80 years, and every single electron of the electricity you used came from nuclear energy. In fact, let's go further and say your per capita share of the entire United States electricity was 100% nuclear. And for 80 years, your share of used nuclear fuel would be one soda can's worth. Right? One soda can, um, you wouldn't want to put it under your pillow. <laughs> okay, so it's a volume measurement, it's not a hazard measurement, it's spent nuclear fuel is hazardous, it's highly radioactive, but it's not very much material for a lifetime's worth of electricity consumption. Right, so it's compact. The next is it's contained. Right, so I talked a little bit about what fuel is. It's a solid fuel pellet, it's a ceramic. Right, if there were a carpet here, I might take a mug and just drop it and say, you know, if I drop the mug, like maybe it's better if it does break, because it gets the point across that if it breaks as a solid, we can sweep it up and we can, we can dispose of it. Certainly in used nuclear fuel, there are gases and there are, there are things that come as, as volatile fumes, but not very much of it, and it's, a, it's not a difficult problem to keep to, to, to tackle. Right? But it's a solid fuel pellet. It sits inside a metal rod, and then we store this inside a steel canister, which then goes inside of a storage or shipping cask. So there's many, many layers of solid things protecting you from other solid things. Okay, so one of the things I want people to understand about spent nuclear fuel is many people have this Godzilla image of ooze, glowing green ooze. Right? Spent nuclear fuel is not that. Right? Spent nuclear fuel is a solid material. We know how to move it around. We ship use nuclear fuel around the country regularly right now, mostly military spent naval reactor fuel. Um, but but it's, a very, it's something we know how to deal with. And the last C is cared for. Right, so used nuclear fuel as a waste product is one of the most carefully tracked and cared for waste products in our energy system, if not energy system, if not any industrial system. We carefully track where every single piece of it is. Because it's solid, we can do that. Every fuel assembly has a serial number and we know where they all are. We have decades of safe handling experience in dealing with these fuel assemblies. And we were talking about this at dinner. It's remarkably easy to detect and monitor radiation because we can't 
taste or smell or feel or see or hear radiation, we spent 60 to 100 years developing remarkably sensitive detectors, all of which can detect very minute amounts of radiation. Whether it's a state trooper on the New York Turnpike who has a detector <coughs> from, thanks to Homeland Security in his, his squad car <coughs> that goes off as another car goes past, he pulls them over and finds out they've had a nuclear medicine technique the day before. And they have radioactive iodine in their system. Mm -hmm. And that radioactive iodine is something that he could detect in a moving car from the system that's put into his car. Right? And so we've developed really good systems to, to detect and monitor radiation. And the last thing, the most important thing, transitioning into this question of policy, is we've been paying for the long-term geologic disposal of used nuclear fuel since 1982. Right? And we have over $20 billion amassed in a fund under the control of the US Treasury to pay for the long-term disposal of used nuclear fuel. Right? So let's talk a little bit about that. Until 1977, the nuclear industry built reactors, over 100 of them around the country, and they had always had the plan that they would have what we now call advanced fuel cycles. They had always planned that the fuel would ultimately be taken away from their facility, reprocessed into different forms, chemically separated, and then used in different ways, either back in the reactor, some of it disposed and not. So they expected to store pretty small amounts of waste. This was the system they were imagining. You would mine uranium, this is the same icons you might recognize from before, but instead of taking this light water reactor fuel and putting it straight in a geologic repository, instead we'd put it into some kind of separations facility, a large chemical engineering facility, not a nuclear engineering facility per se, but merely more of a chemical engineering facility. And from that, we would take some amount of waste in some schemes from which this picture was taken, the lighter than uranium part, right? It doesn't have much use to us anymore. We put that underground. Remember, it was only about three and a half percent, right? And we take the other parts, the heavier than uranium parts and the rest of the uranium, and we put it back into a system with advanced reactors where we would get more energy from that and we'd recycle it, right? It's <laughs> hard to go into a building today without a recycling bin in it. Yet in the nuclear industry, recycling is something that we just haven't managed to get our hands around yet. Right? And so you'd recycle this ideally, and, and you're never going to be ideal, but and engineers like to think about ideals. Ideally, you're only putting the fission products, the lighter than uranium part, underground, and you're getting energy out of everything else. <clears throat> well, we don't do that. One of the reasons, probably the turning point, was in 1977, an executive order issued by President Carter basically made it impossible to recycle. Right? The dominant concern was the concern for creating a global market for plutonium. Plutonium does not occur in nature. We produce it in our reactors, whether we like it or not, and it is used in the most powerful nuclear weapons in the world. And so the concern in 1977 in the face of, of global weapons expansion into India, Pakistan, other parts of the world was, if we have a market for plutonium, a commercial market for lots of plutonium, we only need a little bit to go missing here and a little bit to go missing there, and we might be able to amass an amount of plutonium that would make it dangerous. So this was the driving force behind this concern. It put a stop to all reprocessing in the United States. It turns out it was turned around pretty soon thereafter. In the early 80s, the next president came in and made some changes, but it was already too late. Commercially, as repro uh, re reprocessing as a commercial process, the companies that were interested in it had already lost their shirts, and now we're completely uninterested in getting into that business again. And so that led us ultimately then to the Nuclear Waste Policy Act in 1982, which was then amended in 1987. Um, and we'll go, we'll go back to some of the details, but in 1998, so the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1987, this is now history class, right, instead of science class of 1987, said that the Yucca Mountain Repository would start taking material in 1998. As I like to point out to people, that is the history, not the future. Right? 1998 has come and gone. In 2002, the Department of Energy formally recommended the Yucca Mountain site. The state of Nevada vetoed it, and according to the language of the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, Congress overruled their veto and things moved forward again. In 2008, in June of 2008, a big dolly full of paperwork was delivered to the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission as a formal license application to build and operate Yucca Mountain. In 2010, as a result of political issues we won't have time to go into right now, the Department <coughs> of Energy withdrew its license application. It said it no longer wanted to pursue a license application at this site. Um, it turns out that until about four months ago, 
um, this was this now became the subject of a big legal battle because the law of the land was that the Department of Energy would pursue a repository at Yucca Mountain, and so the states that house nuclear fuel right now, other than Nevada, brought suit against the government, said they didn't have the right to withdraw the application. In fact, they've been found that they do not have that right, and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is being ordered to continue to pursue the licensing of Yuck Mountain, on and on and on. President Obama formed the Blue Ribbon Commission, which in 2012 issued some recommendations. Um, and we'll come back to that. So some of the details, briefly. The Nuclear Waste Policy Act in 1982 said that it was the government's job to take care of this. Basically arguing, making the case that this is an issue of national importance. We can't rely on individual utilities, individual states to really hold the ball for this long-term issue. And it's really something that belongs under the oversight of the government. Um, they established the Nuclear Waste Fee and Nuclear Waste Fund. For every megawatt hour of nuclear electricity generated in the United States, a dollar goes to this fund. Right? It has amassed something like $20, $25 billion worth of money right now. Um, getting that money back, by the way, is going to be a big challenge, um, but we will eventually. It limited the capacity of the first repository to 63,000 tons. Basically to say to Nevada, to say to the first repository, you're not stuck with everything forever. Until we site a second repository, we will not put more than 62,000 tons in your repository. Um, we now have in the United States, I'm guessing it's something like 66,000 tons of spent nuclear fuel already sitting at reactors around the country. So we've already filled up Yucca Mountain before we've opened it. Um, the capacity of Yucca Mountain is larger than that. The state has a veto with congressional overrule. There were three sites at the time in Nevada, Texas, and Washington. The amendment in 87 dropped all the sites but Yucca Mountain. Some people describe smoky back rooms. Um, there was a five-year schedule to try and get to the first repository. That obviously didn't happen. Monitored retrievable storage sites. These are above-ground sites that are used temporarily. They've come back into interest right now. Um, there were some, again, more politics there. Um, did the Secretary of Energy had the had the was empowered to negotiate benefits for the state that would host this site, but it's unclear how much how much latitude they have and had to report it between these dates and did so, in fact, by the beginning of 2010 on the need for a second repository, um, declaring it was not necessary to pursue it right now. We took a mountain. Um, it's on the edge of the Nevada test site where we blew up lots of nuclear weapons for many decades. It's also on the edge of the Nellis Air Force Range. Um, these are parts of, of Nevada and Nye County. They're owned by the U.S. government already. It's completely surrounded by U.S. government-owned property um, near Las Vegas. It's a very stable geology in a dry climate. It's got a very deep water table, so Yucca Mountain is designed to be above the water table by a few hundred meters. It's a remote location. Um, it's restricted by what I said. It's already, it's already closed off and, and inaccessible from the public. And a closed water basin. So the water that does flow under Yucca Mountain is not part of a larger aquifer that flows out into other parts of the country or into our water system. It certainly is part of an aquifer that that, that serves uh, community people now in uh, Nye County. The nearest person lives 18 kilometers away from Yucca Mountain. Um, I'm sort of rushing through this technology part here. This is what it would look like. Each of these fuel assemblies would slide into a, a cask like this, the length of a fuel assembly. There'd be various layers of protection, corrosion resistant barriers, an outer barrier to take the water and drip over it. Um, they would backfill it with earth inside these bunkers that they would drill 300 meters deep under the, under the mountain. Um, so fast forwarding to a couple of years ago, the Blue Ribbon Commission made seven big recommendations. The first three, remember what I said the biggest obstacles were, were site selection. Right? So they have proposed or endorsed or encouraged what they call a consent-based approach. Right? So this is the grand challenge. Right? And it's not a technical challenge, it's a, it's a technical political challenge. But it's to find a way to get every single layer of government from the local community up to the federal government to all agree for the long term, not just for one election cycle, but for the long term to use a single site for a facility like this. Um, and consent-based siting means you need to start at the local level and get local communities to want it for various reasons and then convince their state that they want it and then come back to the federal government and talk about hosting it. This has worked in other countries. Sweden um, has recently chosen their site. They had a competition between two municipalities and there's a famous picture that I'm not going to show you that some people like to show where there's a happy man and a sad man and the sad man is the mayor who did not win the facility because of what they understood the jobs and the local impact to be of hosting this facility. 
Um, the other big thing is a new organization. One of the things that really gets in the way of dealing with used nuclear fuel in the United States is that it's subject to annual appropriations. All the money that sits in the nuclear waste fund, although we're paying into it as consumers, the money cannot come out without an appropriation by the federal, by Congress. And you can imagine, those of you who follow appropriation cycles in the, in the federal government know that that doesn't happen easily. Um, and so a new organization that would take the money and have access to disperse that money as they saw technically fit is one of the recommendations. Um, and then finally access to those funds. This organization has to not just get the new money, but it has to be able to have access to all the old money as well. And you've maybe by now read some of these other ones which are sort of motherhood and apple pie compared to these first three which are real substantive policy recommendations. So that sets some of the framework. Let me finish off with the big picture of what the sustainability challenges are for nuclear energy. Um, any energy source has sustainability challenges, right? We're converting one form of energy to another, and it's very difficult to do that forever. Some things we, you know, natural processes make it easier than others. But the availability of that resource is one broad set of challenges. The management of the wastes from that process are another set of challenges. And the security, meaning a couple of different things, sometimes a nuclear specific thing, but the security of those resources is another part of the sustainability challenge. So if you look at the resource availability, uranium supply is one of the challenges that we see for nuclear energy. Now depending on who you ask and which book you read, you will find people that estimate between 70 and 200 years of pretty economic uranium resources available for us to mine right now, given the way we use uranium in our reactors today. Um, the backstop to that is seawater. Seawater's um, got a lot of every kind of mineral in it. Basically, minerals wash off the Earth's crust into the ocean and accumulate there. It's still parts per million. It's very small amounts. But it turns out that the amount that it's only today about 10 times more expensive to extract uranium from seawater than it is to mine it from the ground. And uranium is a pretty small fraction of the price of nuclear energy. Most of it is building the power plant itself. And so that's sort of the backstop. And we have people around the world, Japan primarily, as you can imagine, very little land, a lot of coast. They're interested in extracting uranium from seawater and making that more economically viable. We currently use, based on the things I've shown you, it turns out when we mine uranium, we currently use about 1% of it. For all the work we do to mine uranium, we only extract energy from 1% of that uranium, and the rest of it we have deemed to go underground. Right? Or we separate out the enrichment process and put it in barrels next to this fellow's house in Tennessee of depleted uranium, which doesn't have a lot of uses. There's a few, but there's not a lot of uses for it. Right? And it requires a to do that. So if we could use it all, if we could take all that uranium, even the good stuff, and I said the not so good stuff, it turns out Dave's gonna tell you how we can use that not so good stuff. If we can use all that uranium and extract energy from every atom of it, it's thousands of years of energy supply. So this resource availability problem evaporates if we go to advanced nuclear fuel cycles that allow us to use all of that uranium. Um, and so one of the ways to do that is fast beta reactors. This is the, the quick look because as I keep promising you, Dave's gonna tell you more about it. But basically what happens is you take this not so useful uranium and we bombard it with neutrons in our reactor until we get this pretty useful plutonium, right? And we put that plutonium back in and it produces energy and the world is a better place, all right? And we have experience with reactors in these countries. Um, the biggest obstacle right now is it's expected to be more expensive than light water reactors and so we have an economic decision to make. How important is that to us? Waste management, we've been talking about that for a while. Right? Despite the fact that it's compact, contained, and cared for, it is highly radioactive. You don't put it under your pillow. You don't want it in your hot water heater in the basement. I wouldn't mind a little bit in mine to save my gas bill, but, um, but, but you, you, you do have to handle it carefully. We know how to do that. Um, there's really interesting questions on intergenerational ethics. Right? This is a topic that comes up a lot with sustainability. Whose responsibility is it to take care of this waste? Right. Our society has generally put the burden on today's society to take care of the waste products we produce and not burden our future generations with those waste products. That would argue for putting this stuff underground as quickly as possible if that's the right thing to do. Right? But if we turn this around with what I just told you, that uranium that we're about to bury is a pretty useful fuel source. So do we want to make it difficult for the future generations to have access to this pretty potent fuel source? So if you argue intergenerational ethics, you could find yourself on both sides of this issue, but whether or not we should be burying it right away, or whether we should be holding on to it above ground. Right? It's also a very politically sensitive topic, but Yucca Mountain is in Nevada. I'm sure you look like a pretty, you look like an audience that doesn't just watch the Daily Show for your news, so you might notice that this, the 
the uh, leader of the majority in the Senate is also happens to be from Nevada. He has a lot of control over how much money gets spent on things like designing and building repositories. And it turns out that not very much money gets spent on designing and building repositories in Nevada for the last 10 years or so. Right, so reprocessing and separation could have a major impact on this. It could reduce the volumes of waste and perhaps reduce the, the, the impact of that waste. Um, quickly looking at this, the light blue, that's the fission products, the lighter than the uranium part. The dark red is the heavier than the uranium part. Right? And what this is showing you is up to 10,000 years after it comes out of the reactor, how much heat it's still producing. This is a major engineering uh, characteristic because when we design the geological repositories, we have to accommodate this heat. Right? And so if we can take all this red stuff and not put it underground, then there's a lot easier engineering problem. And we don't have to convince you that it's a 10,000 year problem. It's now maybe a 300 year problem, which is hard enough to get your head around, never mind a million year problem. But EPA regulation. So this is a major driver to reprocessing is let's not bury this stuff that's hard for us to deal with. Let's keep it above ground and put it back into the reactor. Right, if we do some of these, here's a table that, that summarizes and, and it's hard to do this table quickly, but um, what we're looking at here across this, across these columns are different future scenarios. As a reference point, we have the first column. This is the legal limit of Yucca Mountain is 63,000 tons. Okay. If we take every single reactor we have today and extend their license to operate for 60 years instead of for 40 years, they will ultimately produce twice that much spent nuclear fuel. And that's assuming we shut them all down after 60 years. We don't rebuild. If instead we say, let's take the current fleet of reactors, and as soon as we shut one down, we're going to start a new one up, and we're just going to keep it flat at 100 reactors. It's only 100 now instead of 104. But, um, if we just keep it at 100 reactors for the rest of the century, they will produce twice as much as that. If we say, well, electricity demand is going to grow, it's about 20% nuclear, let's just keep it 20% nuclear as it grows, then we get to 600,000 tons by the end of the century. And if we say nuclear energy may in fact have a role to play in addressing climate change and carbon in the atmosphere, and we want to grow the share of nuclear energy, then we could easily imagine scenarios where we get to 1.3 million tons of spent nuclear fuel by the end of the century. Right? Remember, one repository by its legal limit is 63,000 tons. So that means by the end of the century, in this scenario, we'd need 21 repositories, one in every two states, right? And we spent 30 some years trying to get one of them in Nevada, right? So even if it's the cheapest option, which today it still appears to be, economically, politically, it's not the cheapest option, right? And so that's something to bring into this mix. So now the smart people at EPRI and other places have looked at it and said, well, we can take Yucca Mountain, and we're 100% we're sure that we can put two or three times as much spent nuclear fuel in there from an engineering point of view. So let's imagine we can change the law and get rid of this legal limit. Well, that cuts everything by a factor of two. Okay, now we go to the next thing, the, the, what we call MOX recycle. Here's the light water reactors are going to come into play. Ivan's going to tell you all about that in just a second as soon as I get off the stage. And now we can maybe get another factor of two. And if we go to continuous recycle, only putting those fission products underground, we can imagine scenarios where it only takes one repository, like Yucca Mountain, for all of these scenarios through the end of the century. Right? And if I had the soda can, which I went hunting for before, and I would have held it up before, now is what I would dramatically stomp on it and show you the little wafer of a soda can, which is now the amount of waste that's your lifetime contribution that we have to dispose of. Everyone drinks bottles now. So. <laughs> right? so the last issue from a sustainability point of view is security. And here, nuclear is a little bit special because of the issue of nuclear nonproliferation. Um, it's a very complex and subtle issue, and in the 30 seconds I have here, we really can't cover it in any great detail. But we have to recognize that there's likely to be a global expansion of nuclear energy. Whether or not we build new reactors here, and there's four under construction right now in the United States, but we really don't foresee a major expansion in the United States. But there will be major expansions around the world. There'll be increased demand for enrichment. This is a concern. This is the headlines that have Iran in them. Okay. There's going to be increased production of used nuclear fuel. We've already seen that it can be difficult to deal with this. There will be different national norms and strategies. Certain countries are going to have different perspectives on this. You'll have countries like the United Arab Emirates, who are currently building four reactors, supplied by the Republic of South Korea. And they, their norm was to take the high road, and they have made it illegal for them to perform enrichment in their own country. Right? They wanted to demonstrate to the world that that was not a concern to have in their country. There's other countries, most other countries are unwilling to set that norm for themselves. Many of them are mad at UAE for putting the bar up there because now they're going to look bad if they don't do the same thing. And there's going to be increased demand for reprocessing. 
All right? Because of all these other factors, as we increase demand to engage in reprocessing, these are the headlines that include North Korea. Okay? And so, and I mentioned South Korea not because to mix it up with North Korea, but North, South Korea is very interested in reprocessing. Right now, they have an agreement with the United States that says they're not allowed to reprocess. And all the fuel that they get from the United States may not be used in reprocessing. They say, we're an advanced industrial economy. We know how to do this. You don't get to decide. Their agreement expires this year. It has been extended temporarily for two years because we could not reach a negotiation on, on that agreement. There's a possibility that Korea may um, cease to have an agreement with the United States, which we would like to have for a lot of other non-proliferation reasons, just because we're not willing to let them reprocess their spent nuclear fuel for commercial purposes. So there's all these things that are going to stress the global non-proliferation regime. Right? What's the rush? Okay? Used fuel isn't going anywhere. So it turns out if you look at why we aren't doing anything yet, it's because the technical drivers and the political drivers are not aligned. There's really not a strong technical case for doing anything with using nuclear fuel other than leaving it where it is. It's pretty cheap to leave it where it is. But the biggest argument that's close to that is that right now we have it in about 60 sites around the country, and we have to pay for 60 security forces to keep it safe. If we had it in four places, it would be four security forces. But otherwise, there's really not a lot of motivation to do anything. Um, we don't know yet what nuclear future we will have. Right, there was a, about five years ago, there was a big rush to move towards reprocessing of a particular kind, and the brakes got put on because people said, well, how do we know that's really the right choice? We can, and, and when you invest in nuclear technology, you're making long-term investments because they're 50, 60-year um, facilities. Will a repository be good enough? Will we need one? Well, we know we're going to need a repository no matter what we do. Will one be enough? Will a repository ultimately, once we actually build it, be cheaper than the other options we had? These are all questions that we don't know the answers to. So this is sort of why we sit in this place today where we're really not making any progress in advanced nuclear fuel cycles. is because the political motivation, the economic motivation, doesn't really line up with the technical drivers that we have. And that, so there's many variations. You hear about some of them tonight. The variations are what do we recycle and what do we put underground? And what chemical process will we use? Which reactors will we use? How will we measure the benefit? Right? If it costs more, is that OK if there's some other benefit we derive from it? And what's the calculus going to be in figuring out those, those factors? Here's, I'll, I'll close on this slide with this long list of things that people are considering as the way to measure and, and quantify what an advanced nuclear fuel cycles look like. What is their cost? What is the impact on safety? Um, how will it impact our resource utilization? Uranium consumption we've talked about. What about water consumption? Withdrawals and consumption of water from our system. Land use, disposal space. The waste management question, we've talked a lot about volume of waste. What about the radiotoxicity of the waste? What about the doses to the public? Those are the things that ultimately matter. And non-proliferation, what do we care about? How much plutonium is separated in the world? Um, whether we're burying it, whether we're burning it. Um, what's the total mass of special nuclear material that we have in the world? These are all the kinds of things that my research tries to measure the quantities of so we can help inform people as they make decisions about what the right path is. So it took a little longer. No, I'm still, I, I'm really not trying to keep going. There we go. Right. Thank you very much. All right, so let's take a few questions. We'll go for maybe five, ten minutes with some questions here. Take a short break, and then we'll get on to the next couple of questions. What happens to spent fuel from the naval reactors? So spent fuel from the naval reactors right now is shipped um, all of it is shipped to Idaho, to the site of Idaho National Lab, and then it is, um, I think they reprocess it there, but the waste that they reprocess it into doesn't go anywhere yet. Um, Yucca Mountain, I mentioned 63,000 tons of commercial spent nuclear fuel, but there's also room for 7,000 tons of defense waste. And so one of those states that's very anxious to see Yucca Mountain open is Idaho, because they have a large burden of, of radioactive waste that comes largely from the Naval Reactor Program that they're housing right now now, and they've been promised for many years that it will be taken off their hands. How is the um, spent fuel problems at Hanover affected this whole debate? Is, is it really uh, made it seem like there's no solution to these problems? So you're talking about Hanford, Washington? Yes, of all the weakened Right, so in Hanford, Washington, Eastern Washington, um, is a facility that was built during the Cold War to create and reprocess plutonium for weapons production. Um, and at the time, 
for a long list of reasons. They took all the liquid waste that came out of that process and threw it into big underground tanks, which, as most tanks do, ultimately began to leak um, and are now leaking into the Columbia River Basin and, and actually not very much anymore. So over the last 20 years, they've had a major remediation process there. They've put new multiple walled <coughs> monitor tanks in. They've moved a lot of the material into new tanks. Um, so just a little context of what's going on there. But it's really taking much longer and much more expensive process to manage that liquid waste. So, so your question is related to then what does that mean for commercial reprocessing of spent nuclear fuel? Right now, the process that's active commercially internationally in France and Japan, and soon to be Japan maybe, is a process that's nearly identical to the process used at Hanford, just on a much larger scale. What we've learned, of course, is that you don't store liquid waste. You immediately take the liquid waste and you return it back through various chemical processes to a solid form so you don't have tanks of things. So, so if there's anything we've learned from Hanford is that you don't, it, when you produce liquid waste, you immediately solidify them in some form. Vitrification is the main form, is you take the waste products and put them in glass logs. They're very stable geologically and, and, and mineralogically. Um, so I don't think that Hanford means that we can't do commercial reprocessing. I think we've certainly learned a heck of a lot about what, we've not, about what not to do at Hanford. Um, and this is why when I talk about those metrics, a very important metric is the amount of low-level liquid waste that you produce. Because much of what we talk about when we drive advanced nuclear fuel cycles is a reduction in the high-level waste. But if you produce a big mass of low-level waste that you don't have a solution for either, then you, you have to put that in the balance. It doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, but you can't ignore the fact that you've just taken one problem and turned it into a different problem. Do we have a reasonable estimate of the amount of ETU energy that goes into the mining of yellow cake, or the mining of uranium, turning it into yellow cake, all of the separation processes, including the, uh, the military program, do, do we actually get more than 40% or 50% of that energy back when we blow up a bomb or uh, burn nuclear fuel in a power plant? So I'll take the prerogative of separating those two. I don't know anything about the balance of energy in a bomb. Um, I don't want to. Right? But in a commercial nuclear fuel cycle, we get 40 or 50 times the energy back that we put into it. And I don't know exactly that number, but just to use the numbers that you recorded, it's, it's, a, much, it's a very large return on investment. Energy return on investment for nuclear is the largest of any kind of our, of our electricity production systems. And so in that metric, it's a, by far a winner. Right? If you look at other metrics like um, the amount of CO2 produced in the entire life cycle, including the CO2 that we attribute to the mining and the enrichment processes and so on, um, nuclear energy is in the same category with wind and solar energy. There's studies that are all over the map, and if you sort of look at the sort of uh, you know the, the, the one sigma of what the different studies show, what you find is that coal is up here at about a thousand, natural gas sits at about 500, and wind, nuclear, and solar all sit around 10 or 20 or 50. Right, so there's sort of orders of magnitude difference. And I, I often encourage people that it's not an argument between nuclear and solar and wind. Right? These, if, you're look, if you're concerned about clo global climate change, then those things are all on the same team. And it's them against natural gas and coal. Natural gas is this difference by a factor of two, but, but nuclear and, and wind and solar are a difference by a factor of, of 20 to 100. Right, so the question is, if we, if we know that we can shorten the time scale of this problem from a 10,000 or million year problem to a 300 year problem, isn't that enough of an argument to support the intergenerational question? I think it is, but it's an economic question. And we live in a society, for better or for worse, where the economic bottom line plays a very large role in our decision making. And so when people look at this and they raise the question of how much of change in our electricity price are we willing to have to make this change? And one of the pieces of work, you know, part of my research is trying to come even close to estimating what it would even cost to do these things. Because we don't really know because we're not doing it yet. You know, there's estimates that are all over the map from it costing 
something like you know, 5% more for nuclear energy to doubling the price of nuclear energy. Right? Now, you know, doubling the price of nuclear energy and today it is still cheaper than solar energy. Okay? And so you've got a lot of different comparisons. It's a, it's a, it's a difficult trade-off game. And I think people, to, to understand the energy system that we have, you have to understand these trade-offs. Understand the wins that you get in terms of, um, if you're just looking within nuclear, right, you get these positives in terms of the intergenerational questions, the waste burden, maybe even depending on how you slice the proliferation game, you get a win there too, right, at the cost of some economics where it's going to be a little bit more expensive to do it, right? Um, and so that's something that, that's the struggle that I think we're in sociopolitically. It's, we have a lot of understanding of the technological options that are out there, and we're struggling, not very actively because there's bigger problems sometimes, but we're struggling to figure out if we're willing to spend a little bit more on our energy system. The reality is, what I also like to tell people when I talk more broadly about energy, is our energy system is going to get more expensive no matter what we do. Right? We have, we have $3 trillion worth of investment that needs to be made into our electricity system over the next few decades. And so the choices between things may be less important than the fact that it's just going to get more expensive. It was going to require major infrastructure investment to support our economy over the next few decades. And so, um, so, so these things, it, it's, it's what makes it fun. Students have questions. Uh, looking at a more global scale, how likely it is, is it that these sorts of reactors that we're using here, either the light water reactors we have now or advanced reactors, would be able to use in countries that don't currently have nuclear power. How likely is that on an international scale? So the question is about the international expansion of nuclear energy and, and which technologies make sense there, current light water reactors, future reactors. I think that, that um, countries that don't already have nuclear energy, light water reactors are the natural way in. Because we have so much experience now in doing it well in the United States, in France, in Japan, um, primarily those three countries, we can export that know-how in a way that will make countries really comfortable with adopting this new technology. There's a lot of, in, of human infrastructure you have to build to allow nuclear energy to happen in your country. You need a regulatory system, right? And we've learned recently that, that not all regulatory systems are the same, and so you have to take some care to building a regulatory system that's going to be effective. You need to train people to run and operate these reactors. There's only so long that a country like UAE is going to want to have a Korean workforce operating the reactors. They're going to want a domestic workforce in control of their reactors. Right? And so there's a lot of infrastructure you need to build. And some countries, by their own admission, aren't ready for it. So a story I, I like to tell, in 1998, I went to the Global Climate Change Conference in Bonn, Germany. And we took, um, representing the American Nuclear Society, and we took a group of delegates out to see a reactor that was nearby in Bonn. It had been shut down for 10 years. Their own political regulatory issues had meant that it operated for one year and then was shut down forever. Um, and so we could go and, and see this. And even to go see the shutdown reactor that hadn't operated for over a decade and go into the containment, we had to put on an anti-contamination suit. And we had to do a whole drill where you got to cross the line. And if you cross the line at the wrong time, then the alarms go off and you've done things wrong. And there was a couple of delegates from a country that I won't name right, that, after going through this process, realized that they didn't think their country's current culture in 1998 could support the safety culture that they were witnessing was part of having nuclear energy. Right? And so the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, one of its roles is to go into countries as they're beginning to adopt nuclear energy and help them set up the human institutions that are necessary to do this. So that's the human answer to your question about technology. Light water reactors are the easy way to get in because you can get a lot of assistance from a long time of experience. Ultimately, those countries, if they're really serious, they're going to be wanting advanced technology as well. So um, small modular reactors are one of the other on-ramps. It's a new technology you can hear a little bit about. It. I've got some hints. Um, and then even advanced technologies. Pebble bed reactors, South Africa was the lead um, country studying that. They do have some reactors already, but they were studying pebble bed technology, and they were a leader in that for a while. One more. Short question, then we'll transition. Short answer. Yeah. Since the government is now along in processing of spent fuel, are they funding research to look at improved ways of doing it, or is anyone looking at improved ways of doing it? How big an effort is that? So there is research ongoing. There's, I don't know, 50 to 70 million dollars a year of federal government research in advanced fuel cycles of one form or another. Um, it's not correct to say that the government doesn't allow it anymore. It has actually 
you know, it's, it's kind of a wishy-washy issue. There's no legislation that prevents reprocessing today. Um, to get a license and get approved to do it, there might be so many hurdles you have to jump through that it's effectively prevented. The government is spending, as I say, let's say about $70 million a year on advanced fuel cycle. A lot of that is looking at, um, I think, a lot of it is looking at the fuel forms. Right? We know how to make uranium into fuel. But once we start taking the soup of heavier than uranium transuranics and try and make solid, safe fuel out of it, that creates a whole bunch of new world that we haven't experienced before. We, we don't, we know how to do some of it. And again, Dave's going to tell you that we've done it before. Right? But, but we don't have a fuel that's being tested and licensed by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission with this big combination of americium, and curium and plutonium and neptunium and everything else. All right, thank you all. Thank you.